All right, so I am thrilled to introduce three presenters today for our topic, which is the Making of a Space podcast. Um, the gentleman who's going to act as your MC from here on out is John Molnix, and it was his volunteer work with us that inspired me to choose this topic because he's been working on the Cosmosphere's very own podcast for almost six years as a volunteer. Um, the Cosmosphere podcast is a journey into history and science where listeners discover inspiration that can only be found at the Cosmosphere. And John is also creator and host of his own podcast. It's called The Space Shot. That's described as a concentrated dose of space awesomeness. So I hope you can check that out. Um, and then we knew if we were going to talk about space podcasts, we had to talk about our favorite space podcast influencers, Emily Carney and Dave Giles. So they are joining us via Zoom. You'll hear from them in a moment. Emily Carney is a historian and writer and a United States Navy veteran. And Dave Giles is a singer and songwriter from London, England, who has always had a passion for space flight. Together, they host Space and Things, a very popular weekly podcast devoted to the exploration of space, covering past, present, and future of space flight. So without any further ado, please welcome John Molnix, Emily Carney, and Dave Giles. Give me one second. Good morning. Oops, let me adjust this. There we go. So 2,190 hours or 131,400 minutes, which works out to about 42 hours a week, six hours a day for an entire year. That's how much time it took to do the space shot for the first season when I was doing an episode a day. Um, now, coming up on six years later, there's been 430 episodes out, uh, clocking in at over 74 hours long with hundreds of thousands of downloads all over the world. Um, I wanted to calculate how much I've written in that time, but it's hard to get an exact amount. Um, writing in OneNote, Microsoft Word, randomly jotting down ideas on my iPhone as I'm reading a book or something like that. It's, it's hard to get a, a handle on exactly how much I've written, but according to Grammarly, which I've used a little bit over the last few years, I'm at over 1.9 million words written between episode notes, social media content, and blog posts, which kind of bonkers. <laughs> Um, I bring up all these numbers because the Space Shot and the Cosmosphere podcast have been a huge part of my life over the last six years. Um, in that time, I've gone from being a bachelor to being married, um, moving from Colorado to Kansas, um, and I've just had a lot of life experiences happen in the past six years that it, it's kind of hard to keep track of everything. Can you hear me now? Bump the volume, maybe? Or do you want me to go a little closer? Okay. Um, so about six years ago, I emailed uh, Mimi and a few other people to Cosmosphere um, asking if they'd like to start a podcast. Um, thankfully, they said yes, which is partly why I'm here today. Um, and speaking as someone who's been in sales their whole life, uh, being one for one on a cold pitch is pretty good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that success rate. Um, Maria was wanting us to talk about, you know, what gets us out of bed and engaged with a podcast. And for me, that's just who I am. Um, I grew up in the 90s, huge space nerd, got to watch a lot of shuttle flights, um, read a lot of Star Trek books, watched a lot of science fiction. So for me, that, that really set the foundation. Um, I'd be remiss not to thank my parents. Um, they owned a jewelry store in Colorado. And when I was a little kid, they paid me in a open line of credit at a used bookstore that was right next door. So I'd clean the glass and then go over and buy a book. I thought it was a great deal. Uh, <laughs> turned out all right. Um, I'm also thankful um, we had clients in my parents shop that would deliver, I don't know if anybody remembers these, but the printed off NASA education materials that were available in the 90s. Um, one of them literally brought a box, I think one day, and I actually found some of those old documents uh, when we were moving to Kansas last year. Um, that, that really laid the foundation for what I wanted to do in college. Um, I was thankful and lucky to have three professors who let me get away with doing a lot of independent study uh, courses. Uh, 
Dr. Brady, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Robles, they gave me the ability to read about space history and political theory, um, and I'm really thankful for that. And that kind of laid the foundation um, for doing the podcast, for writing the social media content that you know, is, is crucial for sharing the, the story of space exploration with everyone online these days. Um, I know we'll talk, talk with Emily and Dave about this more, uh, but for me, the creative process, being able to read about something, synthesize that, and then write about it, um, and either share it in a podcast or a written blog post has been very rewarding over the last few years. Um, it's hard to imagine not doing anything, uh, not doing any podcasting or blogging, um, especially with how big of a part it's been, or how big of a part of my life it's been over these last few years. Um, I think the biggest challenge doing a space podcast, and I know we'll talk with Emily and Dave more about this, but there's a lot to forget. <laughs> um, 365 daily episodes, I, I had one of my cousins ask me a super detailed technical question. Um, and I had to go back and think about it because I'm like, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know I talked about it at one point. Um, you know, being able to engage, you know, with my cousin Newell, that was the, he asked me one of those questions last year and being able to engage with people like him um, online, whether it's a comment on a blog post or an email. I think for me, that's been, you know, challenging at times to get the right answer, but also one of the most rewarding things about doing a podcast. Um, we're, we're at the perfect time to have podcasts talking about space exploration. Um, a lot of people think that the best years of space exploration are behind us. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, they did amazing things, but the coolest things are still yet to come. Uh, the first Artemis missions, robotic missions, the James Webb Space Telescope. There's so much out there that we're just starting to scratch the surface on. And that's that's really what gets me going for doing the podcast, you know, starting back up here in 2023. Um, I know Emily and Dave will talk about this too. Um, at the same time, just being able to take a moment and remember the history of where we've been too. Um, Emily and Dave... Uh, interviewed historian Francis French on their podcast, I think it was last week, and they were talking about Walt Cunningham, who recently passed away. Um, they were talking about stories of how they met him, and it just, it brought home the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, these guys were heroes, but they were also human. You know, just normal guys, not exactly normal, but... <laughs> um, and they were sharing just some anecdotes of interacting with Walt over the over the years. And I was lucky to meet him just because it got me thinking about it this morning, listening to the podcast. Um, I was lucky enough to bring Walt coffee one morning, <laughs> uh, which was pretty cool. It was my one and only experience as a bus boy. I got to uh, bring coffee to an Apollo astronaut. So again, like my one of one success rate for a cold call, I'll, I'll peek at that. That's the end of my food service. Uh, journey. Um, one of the other things that I've found enjoyable and also just kind of challenging at times is, you know, the podcast, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but being able to also share social media content um, with people too. Um, not everybody listens to a podcast. Not everybody has the ability to listen to a podcast. So being able to share content in other forms, I think is also important. Um, one of the examples of how in-depth that can become is the social media series that we did for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. <laughs> Michelle's back in the corner there. She knows what I'm talking about. Um, that, that series ended up clocking in at around 10,000 words spread over, I think it was like 51 or 52 days, um, which was a blast to write. And I'm thankful that Michelle was able to help me out with that one. Otherwise it wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been done in a timely manner. Um, but just being able to share those stories, I think is what really gets, I know gets me up in the morning for doing the podcast, but also I'm sure Dave and Emily, you'll be able to talk about that too. Um, one of the other cool things that we get to do, and I'll have Dave jump in here. Um, I had to send him an audio file. Ready when you are, just tell me to press play. Uh, 
So I'll give a little bit of background. Um, this was from an episode that we recorded for the Cosmosphere. Oh gosh, three, four, no, it was longer. It was before the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, I think. Um, I was talking with Jack um, about the work that's done at Spaceworks and we were recording a podcast episode on the flight director's console, which was for me pretty cool. Um, since I had the opportunity, I also wanted to get some very unique audio. It might sound a little bit weird, but Dave, go ahead and play it. <laughs> Figures might as well get some cool sounds before these go back and nobody can touch them again. Can you turn it up a little bit? The first one was the abort switch. Second is going to be buttons. So what you're going to hear right now is the clicks from the flight director console. So I wanted to capture some sounds of the flight director consoles before they got shipped back to Houston. so weird each one has a slightly different tone that is too funny dave can you back it up a little bit sorry tone live radio so everybody. weird each one has a slightly different tone that is too funny i don't know if we're going to be able to hear it shoot Dave, I can hear myself talking on that one, but not the actual clicks. Let me just play it on my end here real quick, and I'll hold it up to the microphone. We'll go super old school. Um, <laughs> basically, I mean, there's, there's lots of little things that you can do with audio storytelling, and I hope to integrate these into the next season of the Cosmosphere podcast. Let me play it here real quick. as we get some cool sounds before these go back and nobody can touch them again. The first one is the abort switch. Second is going to be buttons. An old rotary dialer. Um, <laughs> so that was a yeah, one of those experiences that is once in a lifetime, and I get to share it on the podcast, which is really cool. Um, it's why I think podcasts are one of the more personal forms, or not personal, but like um, just they can be unique, they can be very intimate. Um, when I've been doing my podcast, it's literally followed me on a journey from living in different states to getting married, like you know I mentioned earlier. Um, and having the audience come along on that journey over the years, I think has been, for me, the most rewarding. Um, it's definitely been challenging at times trying to fit in a day job and a podcast and writing and all that stuff. Um, but you know, for me, I, I wouldn't trade the last, you know, almost six years for anything. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Emily and then Dave, and then we'll do some questions and just kind of bounce it back and forth. Um, so Emily, if you want to hop on, you're up. Okay. All right. Can y'all, can y'all hear me? Okay. All right. Okay. I'm getting a thumbs up. All right. I will get started. So, uh, let's my space odyssey. <laughs> starts really um not very long after i was born uh I, I was born in 1978 um in 1981 my family uh moved to uh florida pinellas county um and the space shuttle program was just really beginning by that point and uh i remember one day um and and one day and i still remember this vividly i was very little we uh, go outside. My mom was like, oh, the space shuttle's going up. We got to go outside and try to see it because you could see them from here. That's how powerful it was. Um, and I, I still live on the 
in the same county in Florida. I live in Pinellas County. The only time I didn't was uh, when I was in the Navy. But uh, <laughs> so we go outside and we look to the east and all of a sudden you see this big flame going up in the sky. And I, I'm, I remember being, you know, three years old. I'm like, you know, knee high to a grasshopper. And I just was like, oh my God, that's a spaceship. Like that's a real spaceship. And um, from that moment, really, I was just obsessed with with space flight. Um, you know, obviously, in the night, growing up in the '80s in Central Florida, the, the space shuttle was really just a fixture there. Like, you know, you could go outside and just watch it go up. You know, it was just. Um, <laughs> I hate to use the word routine, but it was, you know, in in our eyes, it was like, oh, yeah, the space shuttle is going up, you know, or the space shuttle's landing or something, you know, oh, yeah, you'll hear a sonic boom was not a big deal. I, I think, unfortunately, I think a lot of us took it for granted, because now we would love to have that back, you know. So anyway, I grew up, I was very, I was just a space nerd. Um, <laughs> I want to add, there were not many other space nerds at the school that I was at, I was pretty much it. Um, so I really just, um, lived <laughs> most of my time at the library, at my school's library, at the uh, city library. We, we had a few pretty good space books there. A few of them I remember, um, were the, uh, and, and this, this title is very antiquated. I want to mention that because, uh, obviously we have women in space even back then, but um, we had the Man in Space book. Some of you may know it. It has a rocket, big rocket on the cover. It's from the 60s. Um, I think that's a pre-Apollo book. That's how old it is. Um, I checked that one out a lot. Uh, why is my phone ringing? Okay, I'm going to ignore that. All right. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. I'll try to talk over that. So uh, one book that really, there's actually two books that really, sort of formed my consciousness as far as like space flight is concerned and as soon as my stupid phone will stop ringing I will uh, discuss them all right so there's really two books that uh I really formed sort of my consciousness about space flight when I was a kid and these were the books that I, I read the most the the first book and it's weird because they're both British um why a little southern kid <laughs> in Florida would have, you know, these British space flight books. I don't know, but they were in our library, uh, our school library, which is kind of weird, but they were in our school library. Um, the first book was the uh, Jane Space Flight Directory. Um, some of you who are into space flight might remember those. It was it, this big book. It basically summarized all the space flight um, history, and it also summarized what was happening during the previous year in space flight. And I would just spend hours <laughs> just reading that book. I mean, it was it was big. I still have a copy at home. Um, it's very beat up. It, it, the binding is like falling apart. But I still have this book. Um, sometimes I'll use it as it's as a reference. I mean, it's an it's an old book, but it's still got some good information in it. And I would just spend hours just reading that as a kid. Another book that really was exciting as a kid was. The um, Soviet, and this, and again, this is another title that's very antiquated. Um, it was called the Soviet Man Space Program, and it was by Philip Clark. Um, it was really the first book that I read, one of the first books, I should say, that I read that came stateside that discussed what the other side of the world was doing in spaceflight. Because in America, we didn't really have a clue. Um, there really wasn't a lot of insight into the Soviet space program um, on our side. And that was the first book that I read that was like, wow, this really gets into what, you know, the, the Russians are doing in space. Because um, obviously they have an amazing heritage in space flight as well. So those were two books that really, I would say, changed my entire life. Because I, I think for me, uh, they set the template on, you know, uh, when I was like, you know, really young, real little, I'm like, okay, this is what a space flight book can be. Um, another book I got to mention that also did the same thing. It came out when I was a little older. I think it came out when I was, God, 
17 or 18 or something was um Andy Chaikin's A Man on the Moon. That book for me was like a cultural reset because it was just um you know there's there's probably hundreds of Apollo books out there. Um you know and and there's a lot of good Apollo books out there but that one to me just really uh, just I mean you y'all who've read it know. I don't have to get into it but that one really I felt touched on the the human side of Apollo, which, you know, you don't really, you didn't really hear about, you know? So that was another book that was hugely influential. So, um, yeah. So obviously as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, uh, you know, I, that didn't happen, but I did join the military when I was, when I was got out of high school, uh, did that for six years. Uh, and when I got discharged, I went back to college. I honestly had no idea <laughs> what I wanted to do when I got out of college, you know, I was, I was married, you know, and I was trying to figure out my way in the world, but honestly, I was very directionless, you know, I was like, mm, I'd like to teach and write and stuff like that, but really, I, I don't think I had a set, like, ambition, like, okay, this is what I want to be, you know, or whatever, so um, anyway, around 2010 or so, 20, 20, 2009, 2010, um, I, I was teaching, I, I'll be honest, I did not enjoy it and I wanted to do something different. And, um, so I was like, why don't you just try to write about what you love? What do you love? And I was like, well, I love space flight. And I was like, man, nobody's going to pay you to write about that. Or nobody's going to read, want to read about that, you know? And I was like, well, you might be surprised. Just, just try, just do, try to do a blog about it. If it, if it, you know, if you don't like it, if it stinks, you can abandon it. And I was like, okay. So I started a blog in 2010 called This Space Available. It's still up on the National Space Society website. It's still going on, which is crazy. <laughs> it's been almost 13 years. Um, it's, yeah, it's almost a teenager now, but I did start that in 2010 and, um, and it's still ongoing. And um, it, it really, I think, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of good pieces in there that I think some of them has sort of altered our perception of what we think about certain events that have happened in spaceflight. And um, that's really all I'll say, because <laughs> some of you know what which events I'm talking about. So anyway, um, I don't want to mention the M word. So um, So anyway, let me try to, I realize I'm running really long here. So let me try to get to the point where we started the podcast around uh, 2020. Uh, obviously, the year the pandemic started, you know, many of us were on lockdown, including me. Um, around the summer, uh, you know, I was uh, by 20, and I want to mention by 2020, I was fairly well established, you know, as a space historian. I'd been a guest on other podcasts. I, you know, I'd done a lot of work in the field, so I, I was fairly visible by that point. But um, in 2020, like right, you know, when the pandemic was kind of starting, I get an email from Dave Giles, and I knew him a little bit from Space Hipsters. I we weren't. I have to mention, and this sounds very awkward. We weren't really close friends at the time. We kind of just knew each other peripherally through the internet. So I get an email from Dave Giles, and he's like. Hey, you know, I, I, you know, I listened to you on, um, I think it was the Go Flight podcast. Uh, I, I really thought you were, you know, I like what you said. I really want to do a space podcast with you. What do you think? And I was basically like, okay, let's do this, you know. And it was a big risk because we didn't. I'll be honest, we did not really know each other at the time. I mean, we could have started that show. We could have hated each other's. <laughs> I mean, it could have been like a mess, but I was like, let's see how this goes. You know, I had a good feeling we would um, we would vibe really well. Uh, so I, I I thought it would be, you know, OK, it's a good risk to take. So we did the pilot episode. It went really well. Um, that was probably the biggest risk, I would say, in podcasting was, you know, we didn't really know each other. We didn't. Um, I feel when you do a podcast with somebody else you know, you, you really got to vibe well with them, you know, and um, that was kind of a big, I would say that was a big risk because you don't know that until you work together with somebody, but luckily we really, we hit it off. So we get along pretty well. 
which is awesome. And I do want to say we met for the first time in early December in person after almost three years of doing this podcast, which to me is nuts. So um, so we started in 2020. Uh, we are up to episode 125 that just came out this morning with a, a Josh Stotler from Oak Creek Guitars. Um, I would say um, we've interviewed, I can't even mention how many amazing, not just astronauts, but just other incredible space personalities, space historians. Uh, we've done a few more and things type episodes, which is stuff that doesn't directly have to do with space flight. Like our episode this week is about a gentleman who makes sort of like space Apollo themed guitars, you know? Um, so it's kind of an and, and things type episode, but it it's really it's really cool because there are so many linkages between space flight and other things like artwork, uh, literature, music, you name it. I mean, there's just so many connections and stuff like that. Um, and obviously there's the astronaut interviews we have done uh, for our hundredth episode. We interviewed Joe Kerwin of, of a little space station um, called Skylab. Some of y'all may have heard of it. Um <laughs> Um, we interviewed Joe Kerwin, which was, that was an awesome interview. There was stuff I heard on there that I had, I mean, I thought I was a Skylab expert. I had no idea. I had no idea. He was talking, he was telling us things that I did not know about previously, um, which is fascinating. You know, it, I feel like we're, we're doing what we set out to do, which is to uncover things that we just hadn't heard before, you know, maybe stories that we hadn't heard or stories that maybe you have heard, but there's like an extra sort of dimension in it um we've we've done a lot of astronaut interviews probably my personal favorite and this might be interesting for you guys at the cosmosphere because he's um done some uh book signings at the cosmosphere is uh we interviewed fred hayes um obviously fred hayes uh flew on apollo 13 but he's done so much more than just that i mean he's he uh, flew also the shuttle approach and landing test, which are like super underrated. Nobody talks about those, but really, I mean, the whole shuttle program was kind of resting on his shoulders, um, you know, and those had to go well. There was no, there was no other choice. They had to go well. And uh, we talked to him about that. And it was just fascinating because there was, again, there were things that I had no idea about. And I thought, I know everything about the space shuttle, right? Nope. Not even close. I mean, there was stuff that, you know, he just absolutely clarified for me that that was incredible. Um, so I'm trying to think of the challenges. Honestly, um, I, I'm i not trying to sound, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in about two minutes or so. Um, the challenges. I really can't think of any challenges. I think the biggest challenge at the beginning was, you know, man, are me and Dave going to you know, we didn't really know each other. So I was, you know, there was, I was kind of like, man, you know, are we going to vibe well enough to have a podcast over a long period of time? Because I was hoping it would become like what it is, you know, how we'd have multiple shows once a week and stuff. And we did. So that wasn't really an issue. But I think if you do a show with someone else, you really have to have a good rapport with them. And I think we have that, which is really good. Um, the biggest reward about doing a podcast is, for me, just the discovery itself, you know, just being able to learn things you just had no idea about, or, um, you know, I feel like every week we learn something new, you know, and I, I mean, and that sounds so trite, like, oh, I get to learn stuff, you know, but it really is awesome, you know, uh, getting to hear from people who were there about certain things that happen, you know, from their from their mouth. I mean, that to me is the biggest reward, you know, as somebody who writes a lot about space history and who's a, a you know, I'm a space historian. I've written a ton of articles about space history. You know, I feel like space history is most interesting when you don't rehash it, you know, when you, you try to bring something new to it. So people are like, whoa, I didn't know that. That's really, you know, incredible. And I think we've done a lot of that. So to me, that's really the big reward that's come out of it. And plus, I've, I've gotten to meet, I mean, since this podcast has started, we, we've, you know, had thousands of listeners and we've gotten to meet a, a tons of incredible people. I'm a people person, so I love that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, that 
that's really um, all I've got. Uh, I didn't have any prepared remarks, so I just kind of spoke from the heart. But yeah, it, it's just been an amazing journey. Um, I, I'm very lucky to be doing this show. Uh, I really love it. I hope we can do hundreds of more episodes. And uh, yeah, that that's really it. And I, I and I want to thank the Cosmosphere here um, so much for having us on today. This is really cool. Uh, I I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dave, you are up. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave. I'm here in just outside Oxford uh, in England. Uh, I moved up here recently from London. So that's new uh, in my new little studio, which I'm really proud of. So I ho hope you like the uh, the new room. Anyway, uh, my origin story, very briefly, uh, would be I was massively into space as a kid. I can't pinpoint the exact thing that happened, whether it was a book in the library. I went to Kennedy Space Center when I was about seven. Apollo 13 came out when I was 10, but it was definitely before that. I was already into it then. But I think a lot of things happened around the same time, which just made me super into it. And there wasn't many kids around who were super into it. So you kind of learn to suppress it. <laughs> I don't know if other people have that experience, but you kind of, in your day-to-day -day life, you don't talk about it much or do much about it. Um, and then became a musician and started writing songs. And I, I would every now and then bring in the idea of a space flight theme into a song or something like that. And just, just gradually let people know that it was a hobby of mine was following space flight and space flights become cool over the last few years as well, which is, is, is good. Again, it's, it, people are talking about it more, which is great. And then Gene Cernan died in January 2017. And uh, obviously, I, I imagine a fair few people watching may have seen the, the Last Man on the Moon documentary, which I was a big fan of. Now, in London, we have the Apollo 10 command module. So I went down there. I was like, right, I've got somewhere where I can go and pay my respects to Gene. I thought there was going to be a few people down there in my head. I thought there'd be loads of people down there and we'd be having a little vigil and sharing stories about Gene. So there I do. I go down to the Science Museum in London and I get to the Kamal module and there's, it's just a normal day in the museum. I'm there on my own. And don't get me started about the Science Museum and how they treat the Kamal module. Anyway, um, I'm there sitting there having my own little vigil. I put my little rose down in front of it, which someone comes and takes away. And there's not anything up anywhere in the museum to say one of the astronauts that flew on this has died today and or any of that. And I'm sitting there and I'm getting quite angry. And then a school class walks past who are on a school trip. And one of the one of the students turns to their, it must have been about eight or nine years old, turns to their teacher. Miss, what's that? Pointing to the command module. Oh, that's just some spaceship. And at that point, I stood up and walked away for fear of saying something nasty to the teacher. And it just felt like such a missed opportunity. I was really angry. I mean, one of the science museum doesn't treat that thing very well or display it in a good way. But for a teacher to do that, on that day of all days and them not knowing that one of the astronauts, they could have had a human story that connected everyone to that spaceship at that particular moment, which could have inspired a kid to get into science, whatever. Anyway, I got home and I wrote a song about it called The Last Man on the Moon. And then as a result of that, when I was on tour, I started telling the story of Gene Cernan uh, and trying getting people to watch that documentary. And I just started talking more about spaceflight. Uh, come the pandemic, and oh, actually in 2019, I did a little tour around America, visiting all the other spaceships I hadn't seen. So I've seen all the Apollo, Mercury and Gemini space capsules that flew a crew and went to all the museums and the Cosmosphere was amazing. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, had a great time. So then when the pandemic happened a year later, I was looking for things to do online because as a musician, I was out of work and I was looking for things to fundraise for my next album. And I just said to, on Zoom, I will do a, a talk about my trip that I did, my road trip and tell, tell people about space flight and, and all these different missions and where, the, where this journey took me. And I did a couple of these Zoom sessions and people seem to really like and people say, oh, I love you talking about space. You should do a podcast. You should do a podcast. Okay, well, I've got nothing else to do at the moment. So I messaged Emily. 
and that's how the podcast started and it really was like a, a, a shot in the dark I'm not a space historian I'm a musician who happens to have a few microphones and some production knowledge and spaceflight is my hobby uh, Emily is a space historian and and it's now her job uh, working and writing space content for a, a launch company that's a very different lifestyle and I think that's why it works and we come from it from a slightly different angle um and I've, obviously I've read all my space books up here so I've, I've read loads of space books I've got a fair amount of knowledge but that's one of the challenges of doing a weekly podcast you're looking ahead at the different topics you might want to cover but a lot of them you do fear am I out my depth here do I know enough about this to talk about it how much research have I got to do to create a 45 minute to an hour long thing which is entertaining and the, the big fear when you're doing a podcast is you don't want to just do the wikipedia entry it you could just w read off all the facts about a mission or something that happened from a website but you as emily said we're trying to find something that people may not know about that or debunk something that people think is true there's only so much of that you can do and especially when you're trying to churn one out every week we haven't missed a week uh when you're trying to do that every week that can become quite hard. So that's the the, the real challenge, I think, uh, is keeping a, a high content uh, level <laughs> is the word. Yeah, just keeping it, keeping the quality of the content up week in, week out. And we're lucky because we've asked a lot of people to come on and a lot of them do. And that means I have to do a little bit less research and I, I feel it works well with Emily and I on the whole, especially when we're talking about the his, his, history of stuff. She comes at it, she gives me questions based on stuff she knows, potentially knows the answers. And I come in with stuff that I just don't know. So I kind of kind of have that kind of a little bit more naive questioning than Emily sometimes does. But the, again, that blend of the two. And that's the other challenge of a podcast is that who's listening? Who are you, who are you aiming in at? Who are you aiming it at? And it needs to be accessible to anyone, whether they're starting out this journey of learning about spaceflight or whether they've read every single book. So sometimes I, I'm, I'm very aware that we may be talking about something as if, oh, yeah, everyone knows that so-and-so had a head cold on Apollo 7. Some people don't even know that Apollo 7 existed. So at what point do you have to stop and re-explain everything before you carry on or while you're having that conversation? And that can sometimes be a little bit tricky to try and balance as well. But that's kind of how the podcast started and uh, and how we how we do things. Um, so the, the other edit main issue for me is uh, is always time is finding that time to to write a script uh for certain bits we script certain bits we don't um do the research then recording and then editing you know you have to go through and edit it and make sure that i do have a little bit of a stutter so especially when i'm nervous i will stutter so i have to cut a lot of that out to make it palatable for people's that. ears wow. yeah I it's, it's, I didn't know that. Well, well, yeah, but fortunately for for you, Emily, and for our listeners, is because I edit it. Sometimes afterwards, I just re-record myself saying what I knew I was trying to say, <laughs> because and then I'm on my own and I can just take out the the bit. And most people won't hear that when they're listening to it, but I have to sit through and listen to that and go through all of that. So, um, editing can take a long time, and then creating it to put in the various places and uploading it and then finding time to also create social content to try and get people to listen to it. It's very time consuming for something that doesn't earn any money. So <laughs> it's, it's that balance of, of, Oh yeah, I'm a musician. That's my job. And this is something I really enjoy and really like doing. Um, but yeah, it all has to work. And I don't know why we've, we've stuck to weekly and why we've not missed a week and not given ourselves any time off. I, I don't know why we do that, but we're not going to, we're not going to take any time off. <laughs> Uh, we will we will continue and we'll figure it out somehow um but yeah the, for me the rewarding thing about doing it is that some of these interviews have been amazing that we've done and not only have i learned a hell of a lot as emily pointed out we've learned so much but you also get pretty inspired we had an episode where we were talking about how to inspire women into science and stem and into the space industry and this may seem counterproductive but we asked a, a, a male astronaut to come and talk on that and that's because if anyone has read mike mulane's book you will see that he was a guy that became national 45 years ago this week uh one of that first group of shuttle astronauts and his attitude at that point was extremely 
bad in terms of how he thought about women. His whole life he'd had through his schooling and through his uh, his forces career and his service had been very male dominated and he didn't respect women and he's open about this and through becoming an astronaut with women he completely about turned uh, and realized the errors of his ways and how silly he was and i'm gonna play a clip now from that interview um which when when he spoke about it just made so much sense and i, I will play that now you are listening to space and things what I would, what I tell people is, you know, you, at, at 75, you really start uh, thinking about, you know, the end. And I, I tell people, you know, there's going to be a day where you're going to sit there in a doctor's office and he's going to look at you and say, you've got six months left or you got a year left or something. And you ought to be thinking right now in your youth that the cure for whatever it is that he's talking about was locked up in the brain of a woman or a gay person or a person of color. And because they didn't have the opportunity to develop the opportunities to bring that to fruition, to bring that out there, uh, you're now in this situation where you know you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna pass along. And do you really want to take that risk that the, the cure out there resides in somebody's brain who you've always looked upon as as somehow uh, dismissed them, basically, whether it's gender, uh, religion, ethnic background, color, sexual orientation, whatever. So I'm, I'm a big believer, everybody, we need to empower everybody. Everybody should be able to bring their best to the table and develop it. You're listening to the Space and Things podcast with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Sorry, I forgot to take the trials off to start and end of that clip. But you'll understand why when you hear clips like that, uh, and when we're in the interviews and someone is saying something like that, it's so inspiring. And then knowing that we're allowing other people to hear that, hopefully getting the word out and messages like that. And it's not that we're setting out to change the world. We're setting out to talk about space, but in the, in the process of that, hopefully we're, we're making someone think about things a different way so every now and then as well, and, and make the world better for, for the next generation. And maybe I'm um, blowing too much smoke up somewhere, but yeah. Uh, that's a highlight there for you and some of the challenges. And I think I've covered most of the things you wanted us to talk about there, John. That sounds good. I think we've got questions from social. I'll start off one here uh, just for you guys, because it was a theme that we, we all three have talked about. Um, whereas educational experiences we've had as children, what do you think can, like we can do as podcasters or communicators to help inspire that next generation of kids, but also what can parents and grandparents do to help inspire the next generation? I don't have kids, so I find that really hard to answer. <laughs> um, if you want, I can start real quick um, while Dave thinks about it. What I can what I think is how we can support the young people is just, you know, my, I, I grew up in a little, I grew up in a different time. You know, I grew up in the 1980s. Um, it was still a time when, you know, if you were a, a girl who was, who was reasonably good in math and science, like I was, people did not encourage that. Um, people, you know, had this attitude like, well, that's strange. Or they would try to tamp it down. Like, you know, I mean, oh, well, girls are typically better in English and history. And I liked English and history, obviously. But, you know, back then it was not really encouraged as much. So I think, you know, we need to not just girls. I think we need to encourage, um, you know, all all students, you know, hey, if you if you love math and science, you don't have to be a genius at it, but you can try to pursue it. Definitely. It, it's something you can definitely try to gain some more excellence in. And I just think creating a, a space inclusive environment is also, if you want to, you know, if you, you have a child who's like really seems into space, you know, buy the easiest thing you can do is just buy them books, you know, buy them books, uh, wherever Kindle books are good too, whatever kind of books are available, just get them books. That's what really got me into this whole thing. You know, as a kid, you know, I would, I was not rich growing up. We didn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, well, I did not grow in a wealthy environment, but I would go to the library 
and they would have space books. And like I said, there were two books there that I just could not stop checking out, you know, and those were the two books that I mentioned, the James book and the Phil Clark book, the Soviet space program book. And I, I they really changed my life. You know, I, I don't think had I not gotten those books out of the library way back then, I'd be sitting here talking to you about space right now. I think there's a another level of that these days, which is also useful to to remember when you're trying to inspire the next generation. And that is there are now many different ways to engage younger people within STEM and science, which isn't always just words and books. For example, Lego or uh, whatever the latest computer games are. There's, there's, what's the one? Minecraft could easily be a way into uh, STEM and engaging young people in different ways uh it could be through playing the guitar or or building a guitar like what we talk, spoke about in this week's podcast uh which is out now go listen to it on all your favorite podcast platforms um but that's why i think it was important when we set up our podcast we, cast, we were space and things and we have done an episode on lego or model building uh or music or art or theater uh, and other ways that you can engage young people uh that doesn't have to be a book i love books so of course i'm also ambassador for books but there's you know watching apollo 13 was a huge one for me as a kid just just sitting down and watching uh whatever movies are out or, or anything like that can be a great way of just lighting that fire underneath and also you know we've got all these great live streams of launches that happen these days and and some of the especially the, the spacex they do a great job with their live feed uh, and and watching them can be massively inspiring, especially if they see you get excited about it. I think that's often uh, often can drag someone along. Do you want another question, or can I um, quickly I go on? Got some questions via social, so I'll repeat them here. He's going to read them to me. Go. Okay. So Sandy would like to know what the. Uh, processes for selecting guests um, and just kind of what was the second part guests and topics okay that's a great question um i know for me sometimes it's just reaching out to people via linkedin sometimes um i i'll let you guys think about it but one that just pops off the you know top of my head is i got to interview tori bruno back in 2018 i think um and that was a blast um topic wise we kind of just meandered around we didn't really have anything you know crazy set in stone other than just some general topics so being able to interview him and just kind of have the conversation kind of flow naturally was a lot of fun i don't know what about you guys oh uh who oh tori bruno so um ceo of united launch alliance so i got to chat with him um in his office in centennial so that was pretty cool very cool um, I'll, I'll start a little bit and obviously Dave can, uh, elaborate, but, uh, uh, we do a sort of a content huddle at least probably every few months, uh, we throw out ideas that we're interested in and we sort of then refine them, I guess <laughs> you would say, but we, usually we have a list of, okay, this is what we, who we would like to interview and what we'd like to talk, what we would like to talk about this year. Obviously, sometimes that changes due to certain events, certain, sometimes certain things happen that are, you know, so obviously when, and I hate saying this because it's horrible when somebody dies, you know, I mean, we, you know, if somebody big passes away, we like to do a tribute show, obviously, and maybe reach out to somebody who knew them or interviewed them or something like that. Like, for example, last week's show was with Francis French. And he talked about Walt Cunningham because he was somebody who knew Walt, interviewed him uh, extensively, you know, things like that. So we wanted to do, you know, a nice tribute show. But um, yeah, so sometimes it's a sometimes I would say and Dave obviously can obviously can elaborate. It's a organic mix, you know, whereas, you know, something just pops up and sometimes it's, you know, OK, we have this on our content list and we we have this set in stone yeah that's that's absolutely it are you jumping in 
Oh, I just wanted to say, I know we just have a few minutes left, so I want to prep our in-person crowd. If you have questions, go ahead and start thinking of what those might be. And Tristan, if you'll just go ahead and let me know um, all the remaining questions online, and maybe we can batch those in while our in-person crowd is thinking of their questions. So what else do we have from our Zoom folks? And hello, Zoom folks. Thank you for joining us, too. I know there was one early on that came through while Emily was talking. Okay, great, that's one we covered. Okay, terrific. And I saw Lois popped in a comment there. So Lois is currently Hi, Lois. leader of a online group that Emily founded called Space Hipsters. So you yes. can look that up if you wanna connect with your fellow space enthusiasts. And, um, and uh, she was giving a Lois was giving a plug for camps and education. So nice uh, softball, Lois online. Thank you. We do have scholarships available for our camps. So tell your neighbors, kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews. Cosmosphere camps are enrolling. They're around sixty percent full, and there are still scholarships available through the end of the month. There was a question here. So the comment was, it would be great if part of the regular curriculum was a space month. That does sound like a lot of fun. We do observe International Space Week along with other space sites around the world, and that's in October. So we have Space Week celebrated around the world, but um, the comment was, wouldn't it be nice to have Space Month in schools? Um, any other questions in person or online before we wrap up? Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dave, for wearing that gorgeous shirt. <laughs> thank you, everyone, so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much.